Hi guys, I'm uh, going to be doing a series over the uh, coming months on hiding repetition. As you're well aware, uh, lots of aspects of karate are extremely repetitious and students very easily become bored doing them. So as senseis, we need to find ways to disguise the fact that they're doing repetitious exercises. And um, probably one of the most repetitious exercises is uh, kata. So uh, basically what I've got here for you is um, uh, probably 20, 25 ways of uh, hiding repetition in kata. And, and um, uh, I, I guess in this particular case, not so much hiding as, as focusing on different aspects of the kata. So what I've done is divided kata practice up into four sections, uh, basic, intermediate, advanced and competition. And then I've got ideas for teaching each of them. I'm not sure if this is going to be just a single part, but I, I suspect because of the length of it, it's going to be divided up into sections. So um, uh, the first thing is um, just learning the pattern. Now, obviously, uh, it's with very young children particularly, um, learning a kata pattern can be quite demanding for them. Even first kata, um, some of them can take uh, even years to, to learn, which um, has as much to do with their commitment to learning as it does to the difficulty of the task um, but what you can do is uh, create an environment whereby kids have more motivation to learn so for example um, um, just a basic teaching drill would be that you divide the cat up into steps of three and then you build upon each step. So, so rather than expecting the students to remember, say, a 20 move Taikyoku Shodan, you, you teach them three moves, and then you add three moves, then you go back and do six moves and add three more, and so on, until they have the entire kata. For adults, you might do five moves uh, rather than three, because their memories are a little better. Um, but then here's, here's a really good way to motivate the children to remember those. What you, you do is you say to the children at the start uh, that you're going to be testing them later on and it's going to be a game whereby the person who remembers the most number of moves without a mistake gets to win. And then you, you count for them and they all perform their kata together. Uh, and, and you can have a mixed kata group as well, so, so you know it can be as equally challenging for students of higher grades. And uh, as you count for them, as soon as they make a mistake, they have to sit on the floor, and the, the objective is to become the last person standing. And uh, this not only brings out their competitive instinct, but also has the benefit that those who are out early get to watch the more uh, experienced students uh, progress, so they, they can learn that way as well. Um, and if you play that a couple of times in, in a session, then uh, the children make more of an effort to try and remember. Um, now, uh, there are going to be a number of aspects when you're teaching basic kata that you're going to want to concentrate on. Uh, apart from simply learning the pattern. Obviously breaking the pattern down into sections is, is one way and finding um, finding mnemonics for certain sections of the kata that are, are difficult to learn. For example, um, in, in Cypher you may have trouble with this, with this move. So you may come up with a mnemonic that this is like the Loch Ness Monster's head so the kids remember to keep the forearm vertical rather than out too far. Or uh, you may uh, you may come up with a little storyline about what's going on. So, so in Cypher here, where you reach out and grab, you you may tell them that they're grabbing somebody by the coat and throwing them on the floor or something like that. So they've got uh, they've got a kind of a bunkai in their mind. Or you could even tell a little story, um, just something to keep it a bit more lively for kids. Um, and I'll talk more about bunkai later on. So you're going to want to go through kata. Uh, in different ways on different days. So you, you, you will have different emphasis, different focus according to what you're trying to teach each day. But, but by focusing on different aspects of the kata, it keeps it a little bit fresh for the student. So for example, um, once you've learned the pattern, the most logical next thing to work on is the stances. That, you know, um, very often people are, are gonna want to learn where to stand before they learn how to stand. And then the stances obviously will hark back to your to your um, keyhone practice that you've done. So so you may then have a um, 
a run through where they concentrate on nothing but stances so you don't care what their hands are doing too much just as long as they get the hands right and one way to do this is the um, is the practice of isolation so you might say just put your hands behind your back or put your hands in a guard and just concentrate on the footwork and just get the stances correct now this works on a number of ways not only does it isolate the stances but it also for forces the students to form a strong visual picture of the kata in their heads and this is a much better way of in embedding the kata because now they're thinking deeply about the pattern they're not merely following the pattern that somebody else is laying out but they're having to predict where they're going to go they're, they're having to think about the, the the pattern without the footwork and and of course um the counter to that is that you can get them to stand on the spot and just do the hands and it's up to you whether you the hands and the hips it's up to you whether you include the hips or whether you don't include the hips so for example uh, in Vasudai you may go one two three uh, like that for example or you could get them to go with their feet still on the spot in high kadach turn the body off one turn the body on turn the body off turn the body on and so on so so they're isolating and, and that exercise is also very good because it lets them realize how very very important their stances are to generating power with their hands and and you might want to ask some questions about uh what they felt the difference was between between when they do, did it with their hands and and what you know what they learned from using their hands what they learned from using uh just their stances and uh, using their hips so isolating different parts is, is a really good way to get them thinking more deeply and and then after you've isolated the two individually then you get them to put it back together and and they will often have a uh, a, a more complete kinesthetic understanding that's like that they, 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 they will feel in their bodies more more accurately how their hips are used to generate power in their techniques so it's it's quite a good way you know you teach one then you teach the other then you combine them back to normal kata and and they will have progressed just through doing that then uh, once you've done stances, uh, the next logical step then is to consider the posture. And uh, the posture is, is basically is their back straight. Uh, that's pretty much what it counts to most of the time. Uh, you'll notice very, very often that as people step through in stances that they throw their shoulders or, or as they turn, they throw their shoulders or they stick their butts out inappropriately, that kind of thing. So, so you may have a run through kata uh, and you wouldn't do all of these in one session ne necessarily you might say uh, today we're working on posture and transitions or today we're working on stances and posture and and you just do one or two otherwise you'll drive your students crazy with endless repetitions um it depends on on the um maturity of your class but i wouldn't really run through kata more than say four or five six times in a in a class or they'll absolutely go bonkers um but but uh yeah so so they could have a time when when they're their obviously their stances are given and and then they concentrate on maintaining their posture throughout their kata and, and they're not so bothered when when they're thinking about their posture they're not so body, bothered about their hand techniques uh or their transitions they're worried about how they how they maintain their posture or, or their kamae then um the next one that i mentioned just now is the transitions and uh, the transitions in many senses are the most important part of all because stances are really just the start or the end position of of uh, of a technique you know if if you do a punch and you end up in long forward stance then then kutsudach then then kutsudach really only facilitates the transmission of power at the moment that you hit uh, or if you if you back away and do a shuto uke in uh, kokutsudach back stance for example uh, that's only the position that you're in for the moment that you're blocking you're not going to stay in back stance for for 10 seconds or whatever you know and sometimes i feel that we do overemphasize the static nature of stances so the transitions are very very important so so what what you do is is you get your students to be thinking about how they move from one place to another now a, a little tip here is that almost always your transitions come down to one of two things is keeping your back straight uh, one of three things let's say uh, keeping your back straight using your core your stomach muscles to maintain your your posture your straight back so so your your stomach enables you to maintain your straight back so that you're pulling you're pulling yourself into your stances you're not throwing your back into your stances 
So uh, yeah, the third uh, the third thing that's uh, absolutely uh, vital in a lot of uh, transitions, especially in Goju, but but in in Shotokan as well, is um, not lifting your heels up off the ground too much, not lifting your feet up too much. You know, you you, you don't want to be disconnected from the floor, and I, and I guess that's also typified uh, to a certain extent by. Uh, not bobbing as you as you step. So so for example, as as you step in Zenkutsudach, uh, you wouldn't want your height to rise and fall like a roller coaster. Uh, you want your height to stay even so that you're using your your stances correctly to pull you through. So uh, one way to maximise your traction off the floor uh, and and thus your ability to move purposefully is to uh, keep your feet relatively flat to the floor at all times rather than rather than rolling your heel up and pushing forwards too much okay I think I'm probably going to leave that there for now and that we'll talk about some intermediate um, techniques uh, in the next in the next part take care hey guys thanks for watching hope you enjoyed the video if you did please take the time to rate and comment and it would mean a lot to me if you would subscribe thank you